Well, good afternoon. Um, first of all, a very warm welcome to more than 400 of you who have registered from Singapore and around 20 other countries to today's webinar on the business implications of the Russia-Ukraine crisis organized by Nanyang Business School of Nanyang Technological University or NTU in Singapore. Let me first share a brief context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. You look at the first slide here. After months of tensions on February 24th, Russia forces launched a full-scale military invasion of Ukraine. Kyiv has declared martial law, saying that Ukraine will defend itself. After a challenging period during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the Singapore economy bounced back last year and is now consolidating its recovery. But it could face a fresh set of headwinds in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war, including persistent inflationary pressures, monetary tightening, and new supply chain strains. So what are the impacts of the Russia-Ukraine conflict? We have seen in the next slide, direct impact on supply chain disruptions, inflated commodity prices, and financial risk with banking challenges and permanent or payment difficulties, and also indirect impact from suspension of operations, innovative Russian companies pulling out of Singapore and halted negotiations with Russian food suppliers. The Russia-Ukraine crisis has intensified price pressures, which are now rippling through the Singapore economy as they have elsewhere. This has caused large quantities of Russian oil exports to be taken off the market. Blockages of key transit routes and the interruption of supplies of wheat and corn, all of which have pushed up the prices for food, petrol and utilities, affecting businesses. And this morning, we read that EU plans for total ban on Russian oil imports by year end. Many Singaporean companies in oil and gas, semiconductor, food services, manufacturing, commodity trading, real estate development, and so on, have presence in Russia and Ukraine. So what are the business implications of the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Today, we are privileged to have an esteemed panel. Can we have the next slide? We have an esteemed panel comprising three experts in the field. First, Mr. Manu Baskaran, partner of the Centennial Group, a strategic advisory firm headquartered in Washington, D.C. He coordinates the Asian business of the group, which provides independent economic research on Asian political and macroeconomic research on Asian political and macroeconomic trends. Next, we have Mr. Heng Kun Dao, the head of markets strategy in the global economics and markets research team at UOB or United Overseas Bank, where he formulates forecasts and market views for foreign exchange, commodities, and interest rates. And last but not least, Mr. Bordev Binder, managing director of Blackstone and Gold, Singapore's first energy and commodities law firm. He's dual qualified in Singapore and England with more than 15 years of international experience. Mr. Binder is recognized as a trailblazer in our legal sector. And we have all three to share with us their insights on the business implications of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Before we start, I would like to invite all attendees to send in your questions via the Q&A tab and we'll address them during the Q&A session. Let me start with some questions while all of you are warming up. Let me start with some questions uh, of concerns to many businesses. First, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we are no longer living normal times. How do you think the Russia-Ukraine crisis resets the global economy? And how will the crisis impact the ASEAN economies? I mean, I pose this question to our panelists here. But Manu, as you are close to the actions in DC, 
as well as the uh, business implications to Asia and ASEAN. Can I start with you first? Sure, Ted. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks again for inviting me to, to speak. Um, <clears throat> I think reset is the, exactly the right word. And I can see several areas where you get that uh, reset. Uh, in terms of the economic cycle, of course, the huge elevation of food and energy prices is really uh, <clears throat> rippling through markets as well as the economies. Uh, inflation is higher, monetary policy will tighten, uh, higher costs will eat into consumer spending power and help to slow the economy. Um, we've also had a huge increase in uncertainty because businesses really are confounded by what is going on. You really don't know the extent of this conflict, how long it will last, what other you know, second, third down effects there might be. And typically businesses will, re will react, particularly in Europe, by slowing down hiring and spending, and that will slow uh, the global economy, particularly the European economy. And we should remember, Europe is still the single largest market that we service. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the cycle, lots of things being reset. In terms of longer term, more permanent effects, I think um, uh, this shock uh, will accelerate what is already underway, which is a reconfiguration of supply chains towards greater resilience and so on. And finally, of course, there's a very big geopolitical reset, and that, that has big economic and business implications. Uh, for instance, sanctions, uh, businesses have to think very hard, the risk of secondary sanctions, right? Um, <clears throat> defense spending is going to rise substantially, not just in Europe and the US, but everywhere else. And that uh, <clears throat> can give opportunities, but it can also hurt economic activity in the longer term. And then you have financial changes. I mean, I can't see China just sitting still and just tolerating this higher risk of uh, virtual expropriation of its FX reserves, it will react. I don't know how, but its reaction will certainly affect all of us. So there are lots of areas where things could change. Uh, thanks, Mano. Um, I just wonder whether uh, <coughs> Kunhal or, or Baudev, you have anything else to add on this? On this? Thank, thank you, Ted. Uh, maybe I'll just chip in with what Manu says. I think it's an understatement to say that, you know, uh, things have changed and things will continue to change. Uh, if I can quote our senior minister, Taman, uh, just a few weeks ago, he literally said that we're in a new macroeconomic regime. Uh, needless to say, inflation is going up. Needless to say, you know, all businesses have to rethink how they invest for the longer term to so-called secure their raw materials, secure their supply chain. Um, just, just as a fun fact, those of you who are fans of Gardens by the Bay, I mean, I'm a fan of our gardens. I go there very often. Um, if you read the news, the latest exhibit, you know, the Peony exhibit, uh, if you go there in the first week, you notice that there's not much peonies because the flowers were delayed. They didn't get shipped from China on time. And of course, the fertilizer bill for the gardens have jumped by multiple fold. So it's affecting everywhere across Singapore, and we have to rethink of how we run our business. Ted? Thanks, Gunhao. Yeah, even uh, our lifestyle, uh, even peony flowers are not coming to Singapore. Yeah. Uh, but Dev, anything else to add on your side? Uh, thanks, Ted. I think just on that three points raised by Manu, the one point I want to pick out is the reconfiguration of supply lines or supply chains. The wheels of globalization have been turning one way over the past. 50 years or so. And I think that's slowly uh, turning in a different direction now. And COVID started, it has sort of created that shock to the system where, where supply chains, the need to diversify your supply chains was, was created. That's only been amplified now with what's happened in Russia. I think um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, the, or the severity of it is slowly dawning and creeping up on, on countries because you cannot be energy dependent or food dependent uh, on just one country that might get, uh, that might cease its production or cease its supply. So I think all of these are giving real pause for thought for countries to diversify as much as possible. And I think that will naturally lead on to, you know, seismic changes in the geopolitical landscape. Uh, thanks, Bodev. I think diversification of sources is a uh, really key um, I, I have personally been very involved in Russia and Ukraine, leading business delegations to Russia and Ukraine for the Russia Singapore Business Forum for many years. So quite sad to see what's happening now. Um, maybe the next question I have is, in terms of the direct impact, 
the trade between Singapore and Russia accounts to only about 1%, which is, that's why the uh, economic and business impact may be minimal that we see here in Singapore. However, it's quite difficult to estimate the indirect impacts of the sanctions, which I think we all talked about earlier. So if energy and commodity prices remain high, how will it affect or worsen inflation? So what are, are your views with regards to the business implications from imposing the very tough sanctions on Russia? Uh, how does the demand for Russia for exports as I understand to be set in rubles? I think Kremlin dis imposed that it must be set in rubles. And how does that dif disruption to transactions due to these restrictions of US dollar settlement affect the global trade? And how can our companies do to mitigate this risk? Um, maybe Kun Hao, you can, you can start first. I mean, um, economists on the ground, you must be meeting a lot of companies and hearing some of these issues uh, from businesses. Can you start first? Thanks. Sure, Ted. Um, if, if I may, uh, I'll just share a few, three pages, just, just to um, frame this discussion. I yeah, think uh, there's quite a few quest parts to your questions, uh, Ted. Uh, all of them are very important. And in fact, you know, since the, the war started, you know, uh, late February, uh, you know, there have been variations of all this concern. Um, I thought, you know, I frame it up in nine boxes just, just to make it clearer for everybody. You notice it's color-coded, uh, if you can allow me. Uh, first is the three boxes in red. Now, the three boxes in red have been happening before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And unfortunately, has got much more intense, has got much more in your face. Last night, of course, the Fed hiked by 50, and you know, 10-year yields have crossed 3%, and various central banks in the world have started to hike interest rates, right? India yesterday surprised with a rate hike, you know, New Australia hiked as well, so and so forth. So interest rates going up have started before the war and have started to got worse. So this is what we're monitoring uh, that's been aggravated by inflation. Now you talk about impact to businesses, about yes, uh, Asian businesses have minimal contact, you know, Singapore businesses with Russia. Uh, but, you know, it is the secondary risk that will come in the months ahead that everybody needs to be mindful of. And, and there's two types of secondary risk. First, the blue boxes in the middle. That's basically everything out of Europe. Now, we all know that Europe is in a very different political space, as Manu will say now. You know, suddenly countries have to spend much more on defense, you know, on energy and and all the fiscal costs that have been racked up will get even more, you know, you will think that things are going back to normal post-COVID. We are not. They need to spend more. Of course, European assets are at risk, you know, credit risk from the fall out of Russia. And, and needless to say, you know, Ted, this is a recurring team, sanctions against all things related to Russia, the energy trade uh, is bound to raise costs and have a so-called, you know, an impact a cost to the global economy. So that's all things Europe. Now for businesses in our part of the world, I think what hits us immediately are the orange boxes. Every single business I spoke to in any industry, whether it's f and you know, semiconductor, manufacturing, so on and so forth, has a certain concern, a certain raw material that has jumped, the price has doubled, has tripled, and, and we're not going back. This is the new normal of higher prices. How do you mitigate against that rise in materials and commodity costs? Of course, shipping costs has jumped, right? Shipping costs has more than double as well. Uh, supply chain disruption seems much more prolonged. And, and lastly, I think for all of our businesses, Singapore is a trading hub and a lot of businesses are you know, basically trading uh, you know, out there in the world. And, and the key so-called currency, US dollar, of all our businesses, our costs, right, has jumped as well. Dollar is much stronger since the war has started. So, so you notice that all these things add up, you know, to, to a much more unpredictable, much more costly environment. So I hope I frame this up clearly in red, blue, and orange, uh, so that it's not as daunting you know, not as confusing, but we can frame that risk. Um, just, just another two more charts. We keep talking about supply chain. 
And, and this is a chart of uh, supply chain index as measured by the New York Fed. And, and again, we are on unprecedented grounds. Uh, as, far as, as far back as this chart can see, you notice that we have not had such big supply chain pressure. So the first you know, disruption came from COVID-19 and the second disruption came from basically you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and things are not getting any better. And, and the last thing I think is interesting and perhaps coincidental is the cost of global trade, which is the cost of US dollar, right? Uh, you notice that over the past few weeks, the yen has depreciated a lot. Yen has in fact depreciated close to 11% since the end of February. I use end of February as the so-called starting point because that was where the war started. And of course, you know, followed by the euro, which has dropped by close to 7% against the dollar. And our Asian currencies as a whole, renminbi as well, dropped by more than 4%. Now, some of you argue that this is coincidental. This is because the Fed is hiking. This is because, you know, US dollar is strengthening. But it is happening at a time, unfortunately, you know, that the war has started. And, and we need to worry about this, you know, in terms of the import bills, because all of the costs has went up. So, so I hope this gives everybody and uh, Ted, you know, a very quick overview of that impact on financial markets. Back to you, Ted. Thank you. Thanks, Gunhal. Uh, I just wonder whether Manu or, uh, or Dev, anything else to add here? <clears throat> yeah, I, I <clears throat> very much agree with what Gunhal said. Um, <clears throat> but, but I just want to add in one uh, thing that, um, we are talking a lot about the impact of Russia, Ukraine, and all that. But do remember that there are other important factors at work on our economies, and which will also be quite powerful. So one is the reopening uh, of the economies after COVID, which is resulting in a lot of uh, pent up demand being released that, that supports economic activity and uh, the return of tourism as well. So there's some positive factors as well. So that's not all that uh, too, too gloomy, I, I would say. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for Dev? Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, I mean, my my view is mostly on the orange uh, boxes that Kunhao had brought up, and that has to do with the supply disruption that everyone is facing as well. And I can I can I can talk about it now. What I was going to talk about it is that um, when it comes to sanctions, that in the past few weeks we've been very busy. Everyone comes to us asking us, you know, there are sanctions. Can I do A, B, and C? And typically, you know, I don't think any lawyer in the world is going to say, yeah, go ahead. And and trade with the Russian entity and so on. I think the, the point to remember is that sanctions are very narrow. They apply to a, to a very narrow scope of individuals and companies connected with the Russian regime. And so if you do business with them, then you're caught with the sanctions, supposing that you are under the jurisdiction of the, the US or the, or, or the EU. In Singapore, we have our own sanctions against Russia, but that's, that's even more limited to certain materials that are used within uh, certain raw materials that are used for, for defense and for machinery and so on. So for, for a person to be caught within the sanctions regime in Singapore, I think I think the actual uh, limitations there, the, the practicality of it would be that it's, it's, it won't be as often as you might think it to be. What is happening though is because, because sanctions have happened, there, uh, there is now a concept of self-sanctioning. People, uh, uh, let's take oil for example, right? Yesterday, the, uh, the EU has announced that they intend to, intend is the operative word, intend to uh, uh, prohibit the import of oil, Russian oil. Russian oil is still being freely traded about as of today. It cannot go into the US, but it can trade it in all other parts of the world. What, what the traders are, are coming to me is that they, they just do not want to associate themselves with Russian oil. So they're actually taking a step back and self-sanctioning. When they self-sanction, the supply of oil in general becomes lower. Likewise, when you have a physical war, the supply of wheat and so on gets disrupted and there's, there's less supply going about. Once there's less supply going about, you have all sorts of problems because, uh, because, because the existing demand and, and the, the apparent demand, perceived demand starts to increase and there isn't enough supply to meet it. So it creates this cycle of deprivation, desperation, I think. And that really increases prices. And then everyone tries to get out of their contracts, 
because what you traded today might not be available tomorrow. So you try to knee jerk is just to say, oh, the war has caused it, there are sanctions I can't perform. That that often isn't the answer to uh, to a legal problem, I think. And I think a lot more a lot more finesse is needed, a lot more deliberation and consideration is needed. Because if you just there's no eject button in uh, legal contracts, you know, you can't just press a check and say, I'm, I'm out of this, this contract. By doing so, I think there are huge consequences for them. So a lot of thinking needs to go into that process beforehand. Uh, thanks, Baldev. I think that's a very good point. Um, there is a really a limited uh, sanction and we need to look at what the categories of goods and services that are being sanctioned. Uh, and you also make a point about the self-sanction. I think a lot of companies are very wary uh, and then they self sanction themselves, and some of them are really not under the restricted categories. Um, anything else, uh, Kun, how you, you interact with a lot of companies too? Uh, is the, are there any issues with regards to the legal implication of the sanctions? Uh, companies are coming to the bank and say, well, can they do with uh, these companies? Can they pay uh, to Ukraine or, or Russia? Based on payments, uh, are they going through uh, Chinese banks to pay to Russians and so on and so forth? Are there such issues? I think at, at this stage, unless, you know, as Baudet says, unless you trade directly with a Russian name right. that is sanctioned, that's a clear no-no. Uh, the, the, the key thing is that the sanctions are very targeted still at this stage, certain uh, segments and certain entities. So, so you know, we, we always like to say that in Singapore, we are fortunate in a sense that the amount of Russian trade imports and exports we do, right, uh, is so small that it doesn't show up even on our charts. So, so I don't think the immediate worry is there, but the, the, the secondary worry is if this, obviously, as this drags on, you know, our key trading partners like China, like Europe, uh, will weaken, you know, in terms of the economy, and more and more perhaps will get, you know, caught uh, within that sanctions web, but that will be a concern in the months ahead. The immediate impact should be minimal. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess uh, there are quite a few questions uh, in the in the chat now. So let me let me try to take some of the questions that uh, are here. Uh, one is the outlook uh, on the China ASEAN uh, trade. Uh, I just wonder if any impact on on this uh, China and ASEAN trade. Uh, Manu, you, anything on that? Sure. Um, I think um, my main concern right now is, of course, uh, what's going on in China with the lockdowns and uh, the data that's coming out, uh, the purchasing manager surveys and all that shows that there is uh, quite a significant amount of disruption to supply chains, transportation networks, port congestion in, uh, in Shanghai, spilling over to Ningbo and other ports. So um, I think the Chinese economy, we must assume, uh, will underperform quite uh, significantly in the second quarter of this year and perhaps even into part of the third quarter. So Chinese demand, I think, is going to be disrupted. Um, domestic demand in China will be hurt, but also uh, the Chinese export platforms that uh, import a lot of intermediate goods from ASEAN, uh, those intermediate goods are also going to be uh, affected, hurt by that. So I think there will be some slowdown, uh, mainly caused by the uh, problems in the Chinese economy, which I hope with adequate policy response can be turned around by the later part of the third quarter and fourth quarter. But until then, this is, uh, I think, the biggest concern I have, actually. Thanks, Pia. I think there's a question also on the, uh, that Prime Minister Lee spoke recently about the likelihood of a global recession happening within the next two years. I, I guess there's a question that uh, the comment that he made during the uh, Labor Day rally yeah. uh, speech. So, what do you think, um, uh, the panelists here, what do you think about the business cycle, the stock market cycle? How does that affect uh, Singapore right now? And any comments on that? The, the potential recession in the next two years? Uh, so perhaps I'll, I'll, start I'll, I'll, I'll start on this one. I, I get that quite a lot. Um, yeah. I'm sure, you know, um, uh, how should I say, for, for the person who asked this question, you probably will have read some of the, the economic reports by some of the US investment banks out there. Uh, there are, of course, there is, of course, rising concern of inflation, uh, recession risk, and that probability has increased. Uh, if you think quite logically in the background, interest rates has went up, business costs has went up, you know, earnings uh, is starting to get a little bit challenged. So 
all these are little building blocks for growth slowdown. Now, having said that, specific to Singapore alone, I, I think it's important to note that I, I'm sure Manu will agree with me that our economy is on very sure footing. For this year, you know, there is a lot of visibility that there is strength uh, for the economy in terms of manufacturing, domestic consumption, and, and as we always like to say, our output gap is still very strong. Right? So, so the, the, the fear of this immediate recession, I think, you know, it's not there yet. But having said that, you know, my so-called caveated response to this is, I mean, everybody always says that economists will always have a caveat, is that business cycles will always go up and down. In the next two and three years, there will likely be, yes, some form of a growth slowdown. The, the question is this, is it going to be a sharp protracted slowdown or a gradual glide down like what the Fed is trying to do? to generate a soft landing. I think that is the, the, the key question to ask. And we all hope and pray that the Fed and global central banks and policymakers are able to engineer a soft landing because I won't want to be around if you get a sharp protracted slowdown. Manu, you're yeah. smiling, so please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if I can come in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, Manu. I actually agree with Kunhao. I think that's the key thing. Um, policy reaction. I think that's the first thing. Will policy reaction be credible, effective, and timely? I think that's a very, very big uh, thing. Now, you know, if you talk about recession, it is never preordained. Uh, there are no cycles that operate with uh, regularity like a clockwork. This is the economy. It's not a mechanical system. And uh, a lot depends on the policy response. And I would say that, um, as Kunhao said, uh, how the Fed manages this is important. And of course, there's a big risk here because um, it's not easy to get the calibration absolutely right. And there's a chance of uh, a policy error there. Secondly, uh, China. Is China responding effectively to uh, its own predicament? Because if China goes bad, I mean, really, that's the last thing we need. Eh? Um, and I, 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 I have some concerns there because I think uh, Chinese policy reaction seems to be incremental and very cautious, very selective, very targeted because they have to deal with conflicting objectives and it makes it difficult. So, um, and we don't know, uh, really, we don't know how the, the COVID uh, situation there is really evolving because some of the data looks a bit iffy. So, um, I, I would hope to see a stronger policy uh, impulse in China. Uh, that would actually reduce the risk of an outright recession. The third area of uh, <clears throat> where shock would come is uh, really in the geopolitical arena. I mean, if say something happens in Ukraine that causes so much outrage um, and the EU and, and the rest are now willing to go beyond even an oil embargo to something even more drastic, uh, natural gas or something, that would really uh, upset the European economy and have all kinds of consequences. So we are not out of the woods in terms of uh, further potential shocks on the geopolitical uh, side. But again, I emphasize there are negative factors, but there are also positive factors. Uh, remember reopening of the economies, tourism coming back. Uh, in the region, our region has actually been relatively resilient so far, even in terms of the pickup in inflation, the hit to currencies, and that reflects certain strong fundamentals in the region. As we come out of COVID, um, the region is going to resume some of the structural positive drivers that, it, that were operating before uh, the pandemic, the return of foreign investment to this region. Infrastructure spending is going to pick up. If our region does well as well, that will also help Singapore. So again, let's have a balanced uh, picture. Uh, the risks are real. I don't want to underestimate the risk, but they are also offsetting factors that can help us and which are, I think, positive. Now that you hear from the economist's point of view, maybe about that from a legal perspective, uh, uh, don't worry about the economist. What are your thoughts about? I was going to give my, my economist's point of view to this as well, because I, don't, <laughs> I wouldn't be held to it, right? But as a lawyer, I would, be, I would say, yes, I think we are on the brink of a recession. No one wants to say it, right? So I'll say it. It's this massive wave that's been formed and, and the question really is whether it's going, it's going to crash heavily or whether it's going to go into a, a bit of a slow crash. And I think what Manu and, uh, and King Hao were saying were absolutely right. It's, 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 uh, they are countervailing factors both ways as well that will balance things out. Uh, but I, I, I think to, to run away from, uh, to run away from a, a recession looks quite unlikely. I, I suspect that I suspect the difficulty with EU now is that there is this massive juggernaut against Russia. 
uh, and there are two dividing camps in the world now. You are, you are either, you're either uh, you know, anti-Russia or you're pro-Russia sort of thing. And you know, it's not, it's not a one-member club, which, 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 are, which either side of the fence you want to sit on. And so the pro-Russia, the, the anti-Russia club, in the sense that the, the, of the EU nations, not all of them might want to have the same vigor uh, and same um, dynamics when it comes to dealing with sanctioning Russia. So, for example, some might be a bit more gung ho about uh, oil and gas than other other countries. So they, you know, they, they might be at different stages and willing to spend differently on it as well. So, because there there is this juggernaut, it's quite hard for one nation within the EU to put his hand up and say, I'm not going along for the ride. And so you have to weigh that up as well. So uh, with that juggernaut, the reason why I'm raising it is because all it, my sense of it is that what you need is one catastrophic event to tip things over. You already have got a massive buildup. One thing goes wrong. I don't think the China situation is the thing that's going to go wrong. I think they're going to, they're going to resolve the COVID situation over there and they'll get back on their, on their feet again. But if something goes wrong, in Europe, catastrophically, then I think we are going to see that tipping point. That's that's my uninformed view about the world. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the the question are coming fast and furious. So let me move on to the next topic on the uh, on the banking side, um, the sanctions on the on Russia. The question is not all Russian banks on sanction list, but in Singapore, all banks have taken a position of internal policy, not to accept any payments from Russian banks regardless these banks on sanction list or not. Is that, is that, uh, is that true? Um, maybe Kun Hao you answer this? Well, um, I, I think, how should I say, you know, the MAS has stated very clearly in terms of the rules of engagement. Uh, and, and we are certainly, you know, we have a point uh, in terms of not facilitating so-called orders, you no know, payments. And, and that is clear in terms of not engaging with specific trade financing or commodity financing yes maybe to chip in over here as well i don't think this is constrained to the banks i mean i i hear anecdotally from the traders who have engaged with the banks as well everyone's naturally taking a very conservative view and saying that you know as as long as there's russia involved somewhere uh we we, we don't want to take the risk and i'll i'll tell you why because I can tell you why it makes sense because you know the sanctions regime is evolving. You know what happened yesterday has just changed over over the course of twenty four hours, and you don't want to be caught in a situation where you can see a likely problem and you haven't actually catered for it. So it seems to make good business sense, and unfortunately, uh, you know there's there's black and white, and it falls in between sometimes. And and uh, you'd rather be the sensible uh, business party and take take precautions to it. It does mean that there's a lot of business that is not being done out of out of fear, and I think that is inevitable in a situation of this nature. Um, there's another question that comes in uh, related to this: is that if the sanctions on Russian entities are expanded, which I think is going to happen, will it lead to Singapore enterprises having to exit Russia or even the whole of CIS markets, except Ukraine, perhaps? Yeah. So, what what, what are your thoughts on this? Anyone? Um, Manu, you want to say something here? Uh, I'm not the expert on this, but uh, I, I think it's important not to be get carried away. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, Russia is an important country with a lot of talented people. We don't want to completely cut I Russia think, off. And I yeah. think that would be very sad if we did that. So I think we must strive as, as much as possible within international UN you know, rules and so on to keep the lines of communication open where possible. And maybe I can chip in there as well. I agree with Manu. I just think that this is, it's highly unlikely. It's, it's not a case of you're dealing with the Ayatollah in, in, in Iran or something, right? So it's, it's not having to run away from the country. The, 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 the parties most affected by the sanctions regime outside of Russia are those that are investigatively to their energy resources, the upstream components of that, of that country, because that's, that's the most valuable part of that, that business for the country. And I don't see that uh, best to, of my knowledge, I don't see, I don't see too many Singapore businesses being in that segment that's going to be affected. So if you if you're doing other parts of business within Russia, I don't see it as a case that you have to pack up shop and leave, and uh, and it's even worse to extend it to, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it the CIS anymore, but to extend it to the other countries, uh, Russia's neighbors. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
Um, there's also a question here, again, related to the sanctions. Uh, what can we look out for when it comes to receiving payment from Russia? Uh, maybe the banker can, can talk about it here. Could how, how, do you, how does a bank handle when the receiving payments from Russia? Well, I, I think for, for starters, you know, any enterprise uh, for now will obviously you know, stay clear of receiving any Russian rubles. Uh, there's a question even uh, technically, even if you want to receive Russian ruble for whatever reason, right? Uh, there may not be a correspondent bank who will be able to wire it efficiently for you. And secondly, from a financial markets point of view, you know, uh, depending on which currency you cross the ruble with, it is highly volatile. Meaning you wake up on the wrong side of it, this currency can go the wrong way 10, 20% in a day depending on whatever news announcement. So, so it's only prudent that, you know, you stay clear of this as an enterprise. So, so I think that's that very first consideration. Second, secondary, of course, as what Bauda says, you've got to be appreciative of where the sanctions will carve in the future. Manu, any? No. To add? no? Okay. Um, Bauda, you want to add anything here? Uh, you, you mentioned that earlier, yeah? To make sure uh, about the banks, Oof. Yeah. Oh, the exposure. Uh, yeah, I think that's 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 just a a, a function of the banking system. I I, I agree with King Hook. I think it'd be very hard to sort of find a correspondent bank who was willing to deal with it. And I think the banks take a, uh, as you would expect, a fairly conservative view when it comes when it comes to dealing with it. So when, when parties come to us, there are two layers. Once they sort of say that are are is they are trade going to be problematic under the sanctions regime. That's one layer. But the second layer, which is the more practical layer, is will the banks facilitate that trade? And I think that's a question that they should go ask first before they come and actually try to figure out the, the first layer. Okay. Well, um, I think those are some of the questions on the sanctions part. But maybe now we can look at some of the investment opportunities. What do you think are the areas of investment opportunities in times like this with higher interest rates, and high commodity uh, costs. And any any response to any one of you? It's yeah. not all doom and gloom, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah Manu. I want to tell this the doom and gloom, right? Uh, judiciously. Um, again, you know, there's never a situation where everything's going bad. There's always some um, areas where things are actually picking up. What are those areas? One is technology. <clears throat> um, this is an era of uh, astounding change. We are seeing several new technologies reaching points of maturity and taking off. And I don't mean just in terms of the Infocom area, which everyone is well uh, aware of. I mean, AI, robotics, and all the enabled things that these things enable. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities there. Uh, secondly, renewable energy, right? I mean, just last week, um, <clears throat> a huge, con I think, consortium announced a $10 billion investment in Batam to export uh, renewable energy to Singapore. And there are all kinds of similar things going on. There's tremendous uh, stuff happening in, in terms of renewable energy. Biomedical, there are so many revolutions, new therapies, new drugs, uh, biomedical equipment that can make surgery, uh, surgical procedures much easier. I mean, this is again a huge area of growth, new materials. So there are tremendous areas. It's just a matter, I'm, I'm not talking about investing in the stocks because the stocks in some cases are greatly overvalued, but I'm talking about the real stuff that's going on there. There are all kinds of breakthroughs, groundbreaking stuff happening. If you're careful and understand these issues, there's still areas of opportunity. If, if, if I may add to what Manu has said, uh, there's, there's this big debate now in terms of investment in the sustainability space, uh, whether you know, this crisis, this Russia's invasion of Ukraine has given it an unfortunate setback or whether this has accelerated it. And, and nobody's sitting on the fence on this one. Um, of course, the immediate impact is obviously as a sovereign country, you know, you have to try to secure your energy needs, right? So if let's say your crude oil supply or your natural gas supply like in Russia, uh, in Germany is disrupted, your first order of the day is to try to secure an alternate fossil fuel. That's the lowest hanging fruit. But I think as policymakers, you know, the, the big question 10, 20 years out is, you know, if, you know, this disruption will continue, of course, how do you wean yourself away 
from Russian energy sources. And then that's where Manu's new technological advances come in. Uh, everybody will need to look much more judiciously. You know, uh, it's not just a simple case of making a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2030 or 2050. It is how do you really pick up the new technologies, what the hydrogen, so and so forth, to try to diversify away from fossil fuel. So I'm, I'm a bit on the optimist side. I, I know Baudet is smiling there. Um, I'm a bit on the optimist take, side. Yeah, I, I think take, we will get there after the, 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 dis, the distraction of the current day. I'm going to take a contrary view, and no one wants to hear this, right? But I'm going to say that if I was a betting money, a, a, a betting man, I'd go and put money in, back into fossil fuels again. Uh, and I'll tell you why. That, that you, you see where the, the market is with fossil fuels. Fossil fuels was meant to die in a, a, a slow death a long time ago. And it's still around. And it's still around because we haven't found a sustainable way of using, to, of creating renewable energy as to form our baseline energy mix. And so there are lots of in the press about what companies want to do, being good corporate citizens, countries moving towards greener targets. No argument with that whatsoever, completely 100% right. But where, what is missing is a bit of realism as to where they are with their fossil fuel mix. You cannot abandon fossil fuels overnight. People are sometimes confused about gas. They, don't, they think gas is a green energy. Well, it's, it's actually a fossil fuel. You know, it's, it's, it's ultimately, it's a less polluting fossil fuel. So everyone's investing into LNG plants to build more gas because that's, that's going to be, that's what they're putting their money on. I have two points to make about that. One is, one is that gas, uh, you build a gas plant. It's not, it's not a two year, three year project. It's going to carry on producing gas for 20, 30, 40 years. That's another generation of pollution you're putting out there. Who's accounting for that? Uh, that but that's still, you sort of, People are taking the view that it's a lesser of two evils. And is that, is that the right way of looking at it? Uh, and so the question I sort of weigh in quite heavily is I think there's a, a great opportunity on, on sustainable energies, uh, lithium, uh, uh, nickel, all the things that go into, into solar and, and other renewable sort of energy sources. Fantastic. But at the fossil fuel side of things, and I said this last year as well, too many companies were bending there, giving it up far too quickly and leaving it on the wayside. And you don't, if you don't have the most sophisticated producers producing it, who know how to produce it responsibly, and maybe by trying to reduce the emissions somewhat, you're going to, you're going to leave these assets to a second tier of cowboys who are going to come in and go in and ramp it up uh, in, in, in a different way. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I think that there's scope for both buckets to go to at the, the same time, but it's a matter of tapering down one and increasing flows on the other. But to abandon one for the other, it's just, it's, 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 devoid, of, it's devoid of logic. Thanks, Maldef. There are, thanks for your alternative view yeah, uh, regarding the energy policies. Uh, there are some very interesting questions here. Uh, one of them um, is regarding this, uh, how how will companies uh, deal with the payments for contracts that cannot be revoked or cancelled? Uh, maybe I'll take that. That's yeah, you, like maybe you can take that, yeah. Someone's out for some free legal advice again, yes? <laughs> yeah, legal advice, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, there are four or five ways you can deal with this, this, this situation in, in a contract, right? So the, the basic story or the basic starting point with anything is that you look at what your contract has specified. So anytime there is a, 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 a sanction event or, or supply constrictions, uh, you look at the contract and see whether, whether your specific obligation has been affected by the sanctions. I'll give an example. If you're buying oil uh, and it doesn't say oil from where, and all of a sudden Russian oil is sanctioned, that doesn't mean you get out of it. And it doesn't mean that the payment mechanism out of that stops. It's still something that you can't run away from. Uh, likewise with force majeure, everyone talks about force majeure, which is a clause in the contract that says if war happens, um, then you don't, you know, the, the performance of the contract is suspended. So the payment in this case is suspended. What that, what that, so that's point number two. What that means is that um, the payment is suspended only if your obligation is the one caught by the force mm -hmm. majeure. So if you are meant to buy oil, it doesn't mean because Russian oil is under war or, or, or facing with a conflict situation, that means you're affected. It's not necessarily the case. And I think the law is very clear that just because prices go up, it does not constitute a force measure. 
So you've got two or three more options under the bucket. I won't tell you all of it, but I think the most important point is this, that most people have to renegotiate at this point of time. Prices, are, you enter into a contract for, uh, let's say, let's take a ship, for example. You're building a ship. It takes a lot of steel to build a ship. Price of steel just goes through the roof. And all of a sudden, that contract you entered into, which has a lead time of a year or two years to build, it's now in a completely different price range. You've locked yourself in and you need to renegotiate. You need to go back. And everyone needs to be an adult about this. It's not the first time prices have gone uh, through, through the roof. But if you be difficult about it and you sort of dig your heels in, that's where you're going to see a lot of litigation. And I think my uh, sense of the market is that parties learned from the last global financial crash not to be too litigious about things that the only winner from the and litigation is probably the lawyers. Thanks, thanks about that. Anyone else, that, anything else to add? Otherwise, uh, one of the other question, related questions that how we look like on oil supply and the price, I mean, barring whatever litigation uh, or revoking of contracts, mm -hmm. uh, how we look like for oil supply and price that the world is likely to see. Uh, I, I haven't checked what's the latest uh, in terms of uh, how much per barrel, but how will you see the oil price uh, uh, movement? Uh, anyone want to take a question here? Maybe I'll uh, just uh, try. Um, oh, Kun Hao, you want to go first? Sure. M Manu, you go ahead first. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll see. Um, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the near term because there, there are lots of demand shocks, perhaps from China, and supply shocks <clears throat> if uh, Russian oil is banned and so on, right? But moving beyond the uh, you know, third quarter into, towards the end of the year, I'm pretty sure that there will be a supply response. Um, one US scale, which has been slow to come back, I think will come back because at these price levels is just too tempting. I think OPEC discipline <clears throat> at some point will weaken because it, again, it's just too lucrative to dismiss. And uh, uh, there is a chance, uh, I'm not sure that it's a high chance, but a reasonable chance of a deal with Iran on the nuclear side, which would could bring about a million barrels a day of Iranian oil back into the market. So there are reasons to expect the supply eventually will come back and that would bring prices down, I would guess, significantly. But I don't know if Kunal agrees with that. Sure. So uh, Manu, I think I fully agree with you over the long run, all this so-called taps will reopen eventually. Um, everybody's hoping that the taps will reopen you know, sooner than later. Uh, the, the problem here, right now is over the immediate few months, uh, all the drivers are very positive for crude oil. And, and the ironic situation, I think everybody focused on OPEC not being much more friendlier, right? Everybody focused on the 5% the of supply that's been taken out because nobody wants to touch Russian crude. But the, the thing that's interesting is even before this war, at the start of the year, the amount of so-called global oil inventory, um, what we follow is as measured by OECD, has dropped to below average levels. So, so it is very interesting that oil inventory has already dropped to a less comfortable level at the start of the year before the war. And the war just makes things much more worse. Uh, everybody's saying that, you know, we hope to see demand, a bit of demand destruction coming in, a bit of so-called lesser demand from China because of the COVID slowdown. Ironically, that hasn't really happened yet on a meaningful way. So, so, so it remains to be seen how soon the supply can be replenished. You know, as what Manu says, all the different taps, whether they open much more meaningfully and sooner, uh, that's really a question. Yeah. Thank you. So now, since you're on it, uh, any insights on how the US uh, dollar and euro will trend? Uh, the euro is now at a five-year low, yeah? So, so this is you. this is not a, a a a how should I say a marketing advisory for UOB Bank, uh, <laughs> but our view is of course the euro will be weak, and and if I can extend the argument not to sound alarmist, if you speak to anybody from Europe, uh, most are worried that you know the euro against the US dollar will pull back below parity, and we are not very far away. We're at one o five, before the war we're at one ten above one ten. We dropped like five percent already for the euro against the dollar. And, and again, the drivers of the day are pointing to a lower euro because of the various collateral risks, because Europe is nearest to Russia, because Germany will likely enter a technical recession. And of course, because of that growth slowdown, 
the European Central Bank looks so much more lovely and friendlier than the Fed who's hiking and not aggressively. So all these things point to a weaker euro. Now, having said that, um, I, I don't think the weaker euro is back. Of course, from the European point of view, that's not advisable. But, but you know, it helps to rebalance trade. It helps to, to kickstart, you know, uh, the European economy. So over the medium term, these things, currencies, you know, are feel safe that needs to move to help balance our economic slowdown. Thank you. Anyone else want to add any viewpoints there on the US dollar and euro uh, trending? No, no I, I agree with that, Kunal. Nothing, yeah. nothing to add. Okay, I, I think in terms of the uh, supply chain uh, resilience, we talk a lot about the disruption. I think Kunhao in the earlier slide, you talked about supply chain disruptions too. So one question that some companies have is that companies will need to reevaluate whole supply chain resilience. So is there a trend on accelerating the move towards more reshoring or nearshoring? Or it, I think earlier, uh, was it Bordev or, or, or you to talk about diversification of uh, suppliers or, or sources? So what are the implications to Singapore and the uh, ASEAN region in terms of the potential of reshoring or, or nearshoring companies moving back to home country and so, so forth? Any views on this, uh, any one of you? Maybe I'll just give yeah, it a Manu. shot. Um, <clears throat> I've been speaking to some people about this. I, I think it's very complex. I think in some cases, you're actually seeing reshoring because uh, <clears throat> technology now allows um, automation of a lot of processes. And I, I just came across, I uh, heard from someone about Furniture making uh, now becoming more viable back in uh, high wage cost economies because of automation and that having impacts on countries like low cost countries like, like Vietnam and China. Um, so there will be some degree of reshoring because of technological changes. And uh, <clears throat> secondly, I think there's a, a push for near shoring, which benefits economies like Morocco and Turkey. Turkey has become very competitive despite its economic uh, problems um, <clears throat> because they are on the border. Uh, and very close to rich, large markets, but close enough, right? But where there's a case for continued offshoring, and I believe there's a very strong case for continued offshoring to low-cost uh, areas in many, many segments of manufacturing, um, I believe that uh, given the geopolitical changes and rising costs in China, I think there will be some more production relocation out of China into uh, Southeast Asia and Bangladesh. It will be in certain niches, not in every niche. In certain areas like electronics, China's ecosystem is so powerfully competitive that it will take a while to replace that. But in other areas, I believe Southeast Asia is going to be a winner. <clears throat> Thank you. Other views? Uh, if, if I may add to what Manu says, uh, the other aspect of all this, you know, uh, so-called supply chain changes is inventory management. Uh, it used to be that, you know, if a company goes in their earnings day and say that I have only one day or 10 hours of supply inventory at hand, you, you'll be well rewarded for that. Now that is like a big alarm bell. No, you know, you need to have one week, one month or more of inventory at hand. And, and it's ironic. I, I call this the, the industrial level of, you know, toilet papers uh, hoarding. It's exactly the same thing. Every company needs to hawk their inventory, right? Whether it's metals, whether it's a certain manufacturing part. And I think that that mindset Hopefully, I wish it doesn't get ingrained, right? Because it's a very inefficient mindset. It, it locks in funds, it locks in goods. But unfortunately, everybody needs to do that, you know, to safeguard your supply chain. Whether it's near shoring, it is in a sense bringing your inventory closer back home. So, so guess, that seems to be a near trend that's happening now. So I guess that address one of the questions on whether the shock of the COVID and the recent war uh, there's a kind of a movement away from the just just in time model Indeed. Uh, of doing business. Yeah. So you're holding a supply to ensure resilience and so, so forth. Well, I, think the uh, problem I know is we well. are nearing, we are, we, we are down to about five minutes before the end. So if I may um, ask, um, I think we've addressed most of the questions. I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists maybe to share in less than one minute uh, one of the thoughts that you have to our participants who are now from about 20 countries around the world, uh, how do you think we should advise them to manage the challenges that resulted from the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Uh, anyone to start first? Any advice? 
Manu, if, if you'd like to start. Let me, let me try. Um, I, I think, although I've said that, you know, there are positive factors, the fact is we are in a period of great turbulence and, and difficulty. And the question of resilience now must dominate over maximizing profits or whatever. Mm. Resilience is the key thing. And how do you get resilience? You get resilience through diversification, uh, principally, so you must have multiple sources of <clears throat> uh, supply and you know, your markets should be diversified as well. And uh, you build up buffers, <laughs> whether it is in inventory or in cash. I think, you know, the, the series of shocks that we've seen, it's not just one, right? It's the pandemic, it's geopolitics, it's financial stresses. In a period of uh, global monetary tightening, it's not just a Fed tightening. I can guarantee you all kinds of problems that were hidden in the financial sector will not erupt. And there will be every now and then shocks like that. So we just have to be prepared for that. Uh, be very conservative in how you manage your cash and balance sheets and diversification. Thanks, Manu. Um, Kun Hao? Um, okay. So, so I think I, I always like to say this. Um, even as individuals, you can't choose the environment that you invest in, right? Right now, I think everybody's taking a haircut in a portfolio this year. And as a business, again, you can't choose the environment that you operate in, right? Given the uncertainty. Um, there's a time where you try to, how should I say, try to read the minds of Jay Powell, try to, you know, uh, divine the tea leaves as to how much the Fed will hike, how much interest rates will go up, how much the dollar will go up. I think this is not the time. My honest comment is, if, you know, you're able to hatch away your currency risk, your interest rate risk, or even your commodity price risk, uh, at a level where it is now, uh, that is you know still uh, positive for your operation uh, profits. Please do it. Don't take the risk of trying to divine the tea leaves on where financial markets are going because there are very big geopolitical, very big global forces at play. They are even more disruptive. So at the very least, financial markets, if you can, you know, hatch away your FX currency and interest rates risk. So so that's my two cents. Thank you, Gunha. Uh, Paul Dev, any uh, advice? I think in, in quite brief terms, I think it will just be flexibility. You want to have more options with whatever you do. I think that's true of on a practical level, on a physical level, with your inventory, on a legal level, with your contracts. You want to have flexibility. Uh, and on your supply chains, you want to have diversification. So all of this just works out in terms of all the three, four different uh, layers you have in your contracting structure. In the contract itself, you want to be thinking about it, it. No one used to enter into a contract looking at these clauses, thinking they might actually use it. No one. It's all. It's actually what we call in law. We call it boilerplate because it comes right at the end of the day. But now I think people want to look into it and they want to sort of have. They, they want to have uh, consideration as to whether they can have a flexibility to get out of it at the right time. Thank you. Well, thanks all of you for your advice and and comments. Um, in to conclude, um, if I, you allow me. I would like to say that we must be prepared, as Manu mentioned earlier, for more economic challenges yeah, in the year ahead. Um, inflation remain high. I think central banks in developed countries are tightening their monetary policies and raising interest rates, as uh, Kunhao mentioned earlier. I think the global growth will be weaker and there may be uh, even a recession within the two years. I, I'm not sure, but uh, there are some talks about the potential recession in the two years. So I guess companies, uh, as mentioned earlier by our panelists, should be more resilient and to keep on seizing opportunities for growth, developing new capabilities, and also becoming more competitive. Then despite whatever uncertainties or uncertain climates, despite the pressure from supply chain disruptions and the rising operational costs, I think we can still find opportunities around the world. So on behalf of Nanyang Business School of the NTU, I'd like to thank all our esteemed panelists for your very insightful comments and feedback and advice. Um, and thanks everyone for attending this webinar. And in closing, this webinar is part of the MBS Knowledge Lab series of webinars held every month. So do look out for upcoming webinars. Let's stay connected with MBS, Nanyang Business School via the social media. And please take a minute to do a quick survey at the end of this webinar. So till we meet again, thank you very much for attending.